The Lord be with you. We are studying the Passion Narrative in the Gospel of Matthew, and we are at Matthew chapter 26, verses 69 through chapter 27 and verse 10. And we also uh, need to think about what we would like to study in the future. We have maybe two or three, maybe four, depending on how much we take on, more sessions um, on the Gospel of Matthew, maybe just three. And so Carol and I met to consider what we might do next. And you've usually voted on that, and I want you to give have the chance to decide again. Uh, I'm proposing four books for you to consider that we would study next. Psalms, which we would do at two or three at a time. That would still last a year or more. If we did two at a time, it would last about a year and a half, uh, which is what we're going to be spending on Matthew. And we did on John and some of the longer books that we did, we spent a, a year or more on. So Psalms would be one of them. Uh, and also from the, uh, the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes. That's much shorter. Uh, it would probably take us oh, eight sessions maybe to do Ecclesiastes. It could be 12 if, if we did just a chapter at a time. But um, anyway, Ecclesiastes for a few months, maybe taking us through, um, through the end of the year. From the New Testament, I'm proposing Colossians, the small letter of Paul to the church at Colossae, which is similar to the church, the letter to the church of Ephesus, to, similar to Ephesians. There's uh, definitely some relationship between Ephesians and Colossians. And the fourth choice would be the book of Revelation, uh, which I've proposed before and I think we've avoided. Uh, there are some complicated it is the most difficult book in the New Testament by far, uh, and it's so misinterpreted today that uh, it will it would definitely take some working through. So, uh, and that's 22 chapters. So it's gonna it'll take six months or more, uh, possibly more, uh, given that Matthew's 28 chapters and we've been at it a year and a half. So uh, those are the four books. Think about it. Uh, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Colossians, and Revelation. And later on, I'll ask you to vote on those and send me your votes. Uh, and we'll probably narrow it down to the two highest vote getters uh, and then uh, have everybody vote on those two. So keep that in mind. Maybe make it a note of it and think about it, what you would prefer to study. Uh, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Colossians, or the book of Revelation. All right, back to the passion narrative of the Gospel of Matthew. We left off uh, with Peter sitting outside in the courtyard of the high priest. <coughs> the courtyard, we should imagine as an interior space surrounded by the house. This would be very typical of fairly well-to-do uh, Jewish people in the first century. <coughs> Archaeology has um, shown us many houses like this with open-air um, courtyards in the middle of a house. So Peter has really gone through the gate and into the interior space of the high priest's house to keep track of what's happening to Jesus, to see how it all would end. Remember, it said earlier in, uh, I think you probably look back at chapter 26, verse 58, which said that Peter was following at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest and going in, he sat with the guards in order to see how it all would end. So here he is, uh, Matthew is taken up now uh, this story, having just narrated uh, the trial of Jesus before the high priest, now he comes back to Peter, who is still sitting out there in the courtyard, warming his hands by the fire, as we know uh, from other Gospels. And now a series of people 
come to him uh, and make a statement about him. And he is going to deny all three of those statements. And the first statement occurring in verse 69 is that a simple servant girl, this is no official, no, um, no Pharisee or Sadducee, just a servant girl in the house of the high priest, comes and said, you are also with Jesus the Galilean. Uh, what basis she has for saying this, we don't know. She's just making a statement. But it's also, given the fact that Jesus is being tried uh, and being, and, and being uh, set up by the high priest to be taken to Pilate to be killed, um, she well knows that Jesus is not in favor with the house. Uh, and so she says, you were with this, this guy who is um, not on our side. Um, and is a threat to the chief priest and maybe to the Jewish people as a whole. We don't know all that she was thinking, but she just says, you were with him. She doesn't say that he is done anything illegal, that he's done anything illegal or that he's an enemy, but she says, you were with Jesus the Galilean. The Galilean is interesting because of the animosity that Judeans felt toward Galileans. Galilee of the Gentiles, right? Well, there are lots of Jews up in Galilee, uh, but they are thought of as not pure Jews. They're up there with all those impure Gentiles, and who knows what they're doing, and they, they don't keep the law. Um, so there's this rivalry between Judea and Samaria, like between Duke and North Carolina, or Michigan and Ohio State, I suggested in the study question. You were with that guy from... Carolina. Uh, you were with that guy from Duke. Um, you're not on our team. Um, and Peter says, I don't even know what you're talking about. So he doesn't deny directly that he was with Jesus. He just says, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, it doesn't take long and he moves out of the kitchen, as it were. <laughs> he moves out of the interior space out to the porch outside now the courtyard, outside the edge of the house, on the periphery of the house. He's still there. He still wants to keep track of what's going on. His bravado about I would never betray you has led him so far. Um, and now he's retreating a bit out to the courtyard, out to the porch of the courtyard. And he has another servant girl, not the same one, but another one. Uh, perhaps they've been colluding, these servant girls, um, and he, she comes out to him and she says to the bystanders, now notice she doesn't even address Peter. Uh, she's addressing other people around, bystanders, a crowd, uh, we don't know how big, a small group, but uh, people probably associated with the house of the high priest, maybe a part of the crowd that came and got Jesus from the Garden of Gethsemane and brought him to the house of the high priest. For this trial. Uh, and so these are probably not friendlies or even neutrals. These are probably people who were a part of the arresting party. And this second servant girl says to them, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Now the title Jesus of Nazareth has changed, but Nazareth is in Galilee, so it's similar uh, in its tone of yeah, no good prophet comes from Nazareth, right? We've heard that before. So uh, the bystanders now get involved, and it's gotten a bit more serious, hasn't it? It's not just Peter and a servant girl having a disagreement. Now it's Peter, another servant girl, and some bystanders. And so, again, he denied it, and he adds an oath. What is that like? Damn it, I was not with him. Maybe, who knows what oath, or I swear by the temple in Jerusalem I was not with him. Jesus told his disciples not to use oaths in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't use them at all. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. So Peter, if you're going to deny Jesus, just say no, right? You don't need to add an oath of some kind to it. Um, well, then after a little while... <coughs> And that implies that Peter's still hanging around. It hasn't got any, he's still having some courage, right? He's still there 
even though he's twice been accused of being associated with Jesus, um, he's still hanging around. And after a little while, the bystanders, now these are the people the servant girl spoke to, and they were in the garden and they saw Peter, we know from a different gospel, chop off the ear of the, one of the high priest servants. So they may have recognized him from the darkness, the lantern lit darkness of the Garden of Gethsemane where Peter did this act of violence. Peter probably still has his sword uh, with some blood on it uh, in, inside, his, uh, inside his coat. So the bystanders now come up. Now it's not just a servant girl, but a group of people. It's getting more threatening, isn't it? Think about it if you were Peter. Now a whole group of people is coming up to you and saying to you, Peter, saying to Peter, certainly you are one of them. Look, your accent betrays you. We know you're from Galilee. You don't have a Judean accent. Put that fact together with that you were with Jesus, and we know that you're one of them, one of them, right? The, us against them. You're one of the outsiders. You're one of the bad guys. Then Peter began to curse, and I won't try to emulate that. Uh, and he also uh, vehemently denies that, and he swore an oath again, I do not know the man. What a statement. He's been with him for three years almost. I do not know the man. Well, there's a sense in which we, some of us, have been with Jesus all our lives, and we still don't really know him. Uh, we may know him to some degree, but that's not what Peter means here. He means, I don't know him at all. I don't know who you're talking about. Uh, and he's, he's denying that he was a disciple, a companion, an inner circle companion even, of Jesus. He, do, he wants to disassociate himself from Jesus. He wants to deny Jesus. You're one of those Jesus people, aren't you? No, I'm not. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, sure, I'm from Galilee, but I've heard of him. I don't know him. Uh, I don't have anything to do with him. So Peter, for a third time, says, I do not know the man. He had confessed him to be the Son of God. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And now he's just the man. I don't know the man. Pilate will soon say as he presents Jesus to the crowd, Eke homo, behold the man. And that's all he was to Pilate, the man. And here, here Peter says the same thing. I do not know the man. Interesting. And at that moment, nature intervened as Jesus knew it would. Nature intervened and the cock crowed. A message to Peter from the natural world. God spoke through the natural world to Peter and reminded Peter of what Jesus had said. He remembered what Jesus had said, verse 75, Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. So all the bravado is over. All of the I will never deny you, even though I have to die with you, I won't betray you. And, and he does in a very similar way what Judas did. Um, Judas actually arranged to hand Jesus over to the enemy, but Peter also denied him and disassociated himself with Jesus. And he went out, Peter did. Now he's completely out of the scene. He left the courtyard for the porch, and now he has left the porch to go out into the dark, out into the night. And he wept bitterly. What kind of tears are these? These seem to me to be both tears of, oh, I have done a terrible thing. I have denied the one who loves me. But he's also weeping for his own weakness. 
He's also weeping for his own fallibility. Um, he thought he was so strong, and now he recognizes how weak he really was. And he'll find out that he can be forgiven, that he can accept his weakness, and he can be forgiven. But that is yet to come, quite a ways yet to come after the resurrection. So we finish chapter 26 and move to chapter 27. When morning came, all those people gathered in the chief priest's house with the elders of the people. They confer together to bring Jesus uh, in order to bring about his death, to bring him to Pilate. Uh, they uh, have decided what the outcome is of whatever trial uh, they have conducted. And they bind Jesus, they bind his arms perhaps, and lead him away and hand him over to Pilate the governor. You don't do that without accusations. And so he is going to be handed over to Jesus, to Pilate, with accusations that the Jewish leaders think Pilate will find um, more than interesting uh, and possibly grounds for capital punishment, which apparently in this plot to kill Jesus they're hoping for. We then turn to the other major character in our story, and that's Judas. Judas is another failed disciple. Um, the others have all fled, so we only know what happens to Peter and Judas. Um, but you could read the same story into all the rest of them. They didn't even The other ten didn't even hang around to find out what would go on. But both Judas and Peter know what's going to happen. And so Judas saw, when he saw that Jesus had been condemned, was he in the courtyard too? Um, was he, uh, did he have um, a friend in the courtyard who reported to him the results of the trial? Or did he, through a few hours of time, hear that Jesus now had been condemned and would take in was being taken over to Pilate to be put to death. Jesus, Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned and he repented. I find that important, uh, that he repented. Uh, Jesus' first proclamation in the Gospel of Matthew was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And here Judas is sorry for what he has done. He has remorse. And he, he turns around, he changes his mind, he repents. Whatever his motivation had been, whether it was to force Jesus' hand to declare himself as the Messiah, whether it was simple greed for the money that he had, or whether he was angry at Jesus for criticizing him uh, for his, uh, his criticism of the woman who anointed Jesus uh, with the expensive perfume, who knows what possible multiple motives Judas might have had. But whatever they were, he repents. And he brings back the money that he had been paid. He brought it back to the chief priests and the elders and said, I don't want this money. I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. He's repenting of his sins, of betraying Jesus. I, I see his... his uh, his remorse here, similar to Peter's, who wept bitterly, here uh, Judas is also bitterly sorrowful for what he has done, and he repents of, of what he has done. But unlike what a priest should do, which is to listen to people's confessions and provide words of comfort and forgiveness, the priests do nothing of the kind. They have another plan in mind, and it doesn't involve Judas anymore, and they don't want anything to do with him. What is that to us? Your repentance. Your bringing back the blood money. What is that to us? It doesn't matter to us. What our concern is is to get rid of this um, dangerous character. Dangerous to us, dangerous to the people. Uh, we, we have to get rid of this Jesus. Uh, and so don't come to us with your pious little repentance. Um, 
what is what is that to do with us what is that to us see to it yourself take care of your own spiritual life don't come to us your priests to have counsel and to hear words of comfort and forgiveness don't come to us for that see to it yourself it's between you and God you and your conscience uh, go away Judas and so Judas, throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, departed and went and hanged himself in utter despair for what he had done. I read this act of Judas in light of the compassion of God. Uh, yes, I'm sure Judas also felt that it would be better had he never been born to have betrayed the one who loved him and cared for him. But in utter despair, he took his own life. And so we offer, I offer, you offer Judas's soul up to God for God's mercy uh, in light of his repentance, uh, in spite of the terrible thing that he has done. There isn't any terrible thing that any of us have ever done that can't be forgiven, that isn't covered by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus takes away all sins, the sins of the whole world, and especially of those who repent. So they then are less concerned about Judas than they are about what to do with this money that's scattered all over the floor. Let's pick it all up, and we can't put it in the temple treasury because we gave it to Judas to take somebody's life. It's blood money. So we are worried about this money and we have to do the right thing with the money. So they're very concerned about the money and not at all concerned with Judas himself and what they have been involved in his, his downfall. And so they decide to take the money and buy a field with it, a potter's field, uh, as a place to bury foreigners who die in Jerusalem. Since they can't be buried in sacred ground, probably they have to be buried somewhere. So let's let's bury these foreigners in a in a field, and this field has been known to this day then as the field of blood, uh, because it was bought with blood money. That's Matthew's account of this. There's a different account uh, in one of the other gospels, and I won't take the time to trace the different outcomes. Read the story of Judas's demise and what happened afterward in the other Gospels and you'll see what I'm talking about. There's a slightly different story in the other Gospels. Then was fulfilled, and here's what Matthew's concerned about, aha, I have another opportunity to show fulfillment of scripture. And so he thinks it's from Jeremiah, uh, and maybe Luke does too. I don't know, did Luke not look it up? He, maybe he didn't have a Septuagint with him to look it up. It's not from Jeremiah, it's from Zechariah about buying the field, the potter's field uh, with 30 pieces of silver. But uh, by the way, this probably shoots any theory of strict inerrancy um, since this is not the place where in the Old Testament where this uh, allusion, allusion is to. Uh, it's to Zechariah, passage in Zechariah. Um, did I note in the note uh, in the study notes where that was from uh, Zechariah 11, 12, and 13? That's right. You could look it up and see that it's there. So they took the 30 pieces of silver and they bought this field with it, just as uh, the prophet Zechariah had mentioned something like this in the Old Testament. That's all it takes for Matthew. Is there anything even like this in the Old Testament? We'll call it a prophecy. Uh, we'll call it a fulfillment of prophecy because Matthew post-resurrection is reading his only Bible, the Old Testament. He's reading his Bible through Jesus colored glasses and he and anywhere he can find anything that even remotely happened to Jesus, uh, he's going to call it a fulfillment of prophecy. So that ends our, um, our, 
our section that we studied for this week. I hope you found the study questions useful. I hope you're using your commentary to correct me and to fill out uh, another way of looking at the passage that's more suitable. Uh, but these are some of the thoughts I had as I read through the passage. And we'll move on now with study questions about Jesus' trial before Pilate. Uh, at least that far and maybe even up to the crucifixion itself. So remember uh, to think about Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Colossians, or Revelation and uh, be prepared to vote on one of these and we'll take the two highest and, and then vote on the two highest later. So probably another week or two you have to think about this. And we'll, I'll recommend commentaries and so forth as we always do. So thank you for continuing this study. Um, I hope it is continuing to deepen your relationship with God. That, that's really, for me, the sole purpose of this study is that it would enable us to be more faithful in our discipleship and not just to convey information. Who cares about that? We have so much information and you can get more on the Internet than I can ever give you, than this library that I have can ever give you. Um, so it's not about the conveying of information. It's about transformation. It's about being different and better and more faithful and more holy and more loving people. And I hope that's happening as the result of these years of being in the Monday study group. So God bless you and have a great week. And, and thanks for participating in the study of the Gospel of Matthew.